All right, well, let's get started. Um, thank you all for coming. This is OpenStack. Uh, it's a primer on the project about how OpenStack is a cloud thing, not just for public clouds, but also for private clouds and, and kind of some places in between. Um, it's, it's a bit of an intro level thing. Uh, as I said before, if you already know everything about OpenStack and you're hoping for something deeply technical, I'm going to disappoint you, but I'm not going to be disappointed if you want to find something more interesting for this hour. Um, there's going to be lots of time for questions, I think, I hope. Um, and you can interrupt me in the middle, and I'll try and get to a question as well uh, to, to make it a little bit more of a conversation, less of a lecture. Um, so uh, I am Jesse Keating. That's my Twitter handle. It's the best way to get my attention. And I work for Blue Box Cloud. Uh, they're in Seattle. We do private clouds as a service, which I'll explain a little bit later. Well, let's talk a bit about what OpenStack itself is. And when we're talking about the clouds, it's always important to remember that there is no cloud. It's just somebody else's computer, right? So um, AWS is just a whole bunch of Amazon's computers sitting in data centers that they give you some time on. Uh, Azure, same thing, a bunch of Windows machines, who knows where, you get some time on it. Rackspace, a bunch of different data centers, you get some time on them. <clears throat> so. OpenStack is public cloud, private cloud hybrid. Um, public clouds such as Rackspace and HP Helion, uh, they're publicly accessible. The, the sort of defining bits of public cloud is that you can, um, act, anybody can access that cloud. You can create an account, give them your credit card. They'll meter you based on how long you've got instances running. Um, you just pay a monthly bill for it and shut them off. Um, Everybody's stuff kind of runs in the same general area. There's not really any privatizing of it. There's some privatizing of what sort of network resources your instances can get to when you first launch them. But other than that, it's all this big public pool of computing power that you can take a small portion of, use it for a bit, and give it back. Private clouds are a little bit different. Private clouds are the concept of having that capability of uh, infrastructure at your fingertips, um, but instead of being in a shared pool with a bunch of other people, it's your own computers um, or least time on somebody else's computers that are just for yourself, uh, and then you have full access to that. And you're not having to worry about uh, who who else might be running an instance on that same hypervisor. And then hybrid is sort of in the middle where you might have a private cloud running in your infrastructure, and then you need to burst into a public cloud when you need to get ready for some big event that's going on. But you don't want to have to buy all the hardware in order to handle that burst. Uh, infrastructure as a service it is the whole gamut. So um, there's a lot of cloudy things that were just for files as a service. Uh, that was one of the very first things about cloud. Um, think of Dropbox, uh, things like that. That's um, cloud file storage. Um, when we talk about OpenStack, mostly what people think about is compute as a, as a service, where you get an entire computer that you do whatever you want with it. Um, and that's generally what we think of as infrastructure as a service. Uh, there's some varying, uh, there's a few other things that you can get servicized um, other than compute. You can get network, you can get uh, object or block storage, um, images, things like that. Um, so compute, obviously, uh, networking, images, storage, the whole things I just said, right. Um, OpenStack itself is open source. It is written in Python, almost all in Python. I think there's a few bits of the dashboard that are like in um, JavaScript and a few other things like that, but primarily the language that gets used is Python. It is a community project. It, it, there's an OpenStack Foundation uh, that owns the copyrights and the trademarks and all those types of things. But the projects themselves, individual projects, are ran by election process. There's a project technical lead. Um, there are er, the code gets in by way of code review by the general community. There are elevated people within the community who have put in enough time that they get the the big plus two. It says that when I vote on your stuff being good, that means it can get in. Everybody else has a plus one or a minus one. Like there's there's sort of voting and gating and things like that. But it all happens out in the community. The roadmaps are are, are all done as sort of a general consensus type of thing. Um, 
It's not, there, there are lots of companies who are behind a lot of the work, but they don't get to drive the direction without going through the community first. And this is kind of a, a very basic overview of what the OpenStack world looks like. Um, you've got compute resources, plugging into networking resources, plugging into storage resources. Some of those resources might be using a layer of shared stuff across the entire OpenStack. Um, that's all sitting on top of somebody's computer. And then as a consumer, you would interact with it through the OpenStack dashboard or your applications working through the, the APIs. A little more look, detailed look of what's going on with some, uh, some project names. Uh, at the heart <coughs> of a lot of things, we have Nova, which is creating a virtual machine. And that virtual machine may be consuming an image from Glance to run on it, um, which Glance may be storing its images in Swift, which is an object storage thing. Uh, it may also be getting a volume, a disk volume from Cinder. It's getting its networking from Neutron. Uh, they're all authenticating through Keystone, um, and there's some other things outside of that, like uh, heat orchestration, which talks to all of those things to make stuff happen, um, and then Horizon Dashboard plugs into that as well. So, a uh, little more in depth of what's going on. So, some of the interfaces that OpenStack provides. Uh, this is a look at a dashboard. The Horizon dashboard has been slightly themed for the company I work at, but other than that, it is pretty much basically the same. Um, as, a, as a project, people, uh, OpenStack looks at things in terms of projects or tenants and then users within those tenants. So it was written from the very get-go as being sort of a public cloud multi-tenant thing. So everything is based around that idea. So. Um, Within the project, within the tenant, you can see all the, the instances that are running. You can create instances, you can delete them, modify them, um, create networks uh, to hook your instances together, um, create object storage things, volumes, et cetera, et cetera. Not sure why volume was not. Oh, yeah, volume is in there. Um, so that's sort of a webby, clicky way of getting at some of your stuff. Uh, it's useful for. Um, if you don't want to go very far into your uh, automation or orchestration yet, if you just want to poke at the thing and make machines show up and do stuff with them, totally the way to go. Uh, there's also like a, a, there's also an administrative tab on there that as an administrator for a project or an administrator for the, the entire cluster itself, uh, there are some extra things that you can do um, with your elevated powers that are beyond the, um, what an individual user so an administrator could see all the instances from everybody and interact with them and shut them down if he needs to. Um, create uh, the, the identity tab allows you to create new projects and new users within those, manipulate quotas and, and things like that. Um, there is also a set of command line tools that work on any sort of Unix-based thing that can run Python. Uh, this is sort of a dumping of the OpenStack client. Uh, originally, there was Originally, way, way long ago, when OpenStack first was created, there was essentially just Nova as a thing to interact with all the things that weren't storage, and then there was Swift to interact with storage. Um, over time, n the various things that were in Nova, like network and images and volumes and all that stuff, broke into their own projects and grew their own command line utility. And then we had a lot of sprawl with a whole bunch of command line utilities, and they didn't all work the same and it was a little bit frustrating. And so a recent project has been to try and gather all those things back up into a unified client with a unified way of ex uh, talking to things um, to, to clean that up a bit. And so this is a listing of all, of, not all, because it scrolls way past what I can, can I scroll this? I can scroll this. Um, all kinds of different stuff that you can do with the OpenStack client. Um, and if you find, if you want to work on uh, servers, S server, there's a whole bunch of different things you can do with a server. Um, if we click on that, we get some good information about how to interact with that. So command line is another, another way that you can interact with, with your cloud. No, I don't want to scroll on that anymore. There we go. Uh, but what sets apart clouds and makes them really fancy is you have an API that you can interact with. So OpenStack is all about the RESTful APIs. Uh, 
REST is sort of a, a description of a way a web service should work. Um, and there are published APIs of how to work with the various pieces of an OpenStack cloud. So there's uh, an authentication point that you can get your token from Keystone that says, I am allowed to use this cloud. And then you present that token to the next service, and that service will validate your token and then allow you to use that service. So there's an API for dealing with getting tokens. Uh, there's an API for dealing with compute. Um, for servers, what you can do to create a server, uh, click on some details, a uh, bunch of different stuff that you can supply in the URL in order to create that, serv that server instance, and then you'll get data back about it. Or you'll get a reference that says, I got your request, check back later, and then you check back later and see if your instance is ready. So all these APIs, this is what the command line tools are using. They're just hiding, well not hiding, but they're making it easy for you to use it. But if you are going to embed, um, make OpenStack part of your application stack and you want to be able to burst into the cloud or you want to be able to make cloud resources based on things that are happening in your application, you're going to want to start using the, the programmable API to, to make that happen. Oop, that's too far. There we go. That is again too far. OK. Let's talk about the individual projects. Nova. Nova was the very first thing that Nova and Swift were the two very first things that came to the OpenStack project. OpenStack started as a collaboration between NASA and Rackspace. Um, I believe Rackspace brought the files, the, the Swift portion, the object storage, and NASA brought the compute, and then together they made OpenStack. Um, the compute allows you to provision and manage compute services. So make a virtual machine for me. Um, then pause that virtual machine or reboot that virtual machine or delete it or resize it or you know th those sorts of things. Um, does network allocation or originally did network allocation, still kind of does network allocation if you're using what the old network stack. But it's the, the idea of if you have a virtual machine, you're going to want to communicate with it somehow. Um, that usually involves a network cable of virtualized in some way. So Nova allows, uh, Nova handles, or originally handled, provisioning a network interface on the host machine and wiring that into the guest. Um, it's important to note that Nova is not a hypervisor. Nova works with other hypervisors. And that's sort of a theme with OpenStack. Uh, OpenStack doesn't necessarily want to be the thing doing the work. It wants to be the interface to the thing doing the work. So it's abstracting that from, from the system. And it allows it to be less opinionated. So Nova works with uh, Libvirt. If you want to do, if your hypervisor is KVM or PRQMU, uh, it works with Zen Server if your hypervisor is Zen. Uh, it works with VMware. Um, there was a driver submitted to work with ZOS, the IBM mainframe stuff. Um, there's drivers to work via IPMI to do bare metal provisioning. There's drivers to do all sorts of different things with Nova. You're not limited to a particular hypervisor. Question in the back. Does it also do uh, like console access? Yeah, so um, but it's. A lot of the features of Nova are hypervisor dependent, and there's a big grid somewhere that's, that shows all the features and which hypervisors support it. But if you're doing, I know at least if you're doing a Zen Server or Libvirt, you are able to get serial console into the, the system. Or if you just want to look at what the logs are, there's a, a console log, and it'll scrape that log out and deliver it via the API to you and show it on your screen. Um, beyond that, there's uh, a VNC proxy, so you are able to VNC into that instance and do whatever you need to do, um, stuff like that. Uh, Nova did the virtual machine image management as well. So to boot an instance, you typically have to have an image of content to put on that instance. And so those images, um, they originally were in Nova. They live in Glance now, but Nova still takes that out of the image store and puts it onto the file system that your instance is going to be running. Uh, and then Nova can also create an image out of a running instance. So you boot an instance, do a bunch of stuff that you want to do with it, and then say, make me an image. 
uh, and it'll make an image of that. That can become your golden deployment image that you go and say, great, you've, I've, I've allocated this instance. I've done all of my configuration on it. It's good to go. Say, make an image, makes new, and then I'll say, make 500 of those, and off it goes. Uh, does usage and resource quotas. Uh, you have quotas on how many instances you can have, how many networks you can provision, uh, how much memory you can consume, how much virtual CPUs you consume, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but it also, you know, to enable billing people for how much time they take on the cluster has to be able to measure the usage. So it does usage measurement and reporting of those as events that something else can consume and turn into a bill that you hand somebody. Glance is the image factory, the image storage. So it uh, stores and fetches the boot images. It can store them directly on a file system that you give Glance access to, or multiple file systems if you have multiple Glance services. Uh, it can store them in uh, another OpenStack service. It can store them in Swift, the object storage. Um, it can store them. It can not store them, but it can keep a reference to a web URL of where that image lives. And every time a an, an boot request says, I want this image, Glance says, great, go get it from over there. Or Glance may actually go get it and then hand it back to the, the host. Um, variety of different ways that it can store those. It's also growing the ability to uh, proxy to external store sources. It's growing the ability to maintain um, metadata about those images. So. Some important things about an image, like how much disk space is this actually going to take. So don't try and take a Windows image that's like 10 gigs and try and boot it on a flavor that is, you know, a one gig flavor. Like that's just not going to work too well. Um, you can express that dependency or that uh, that <coughs> requirement in the image metadata. Um, you can express other things in the image data, the image metadata that that will impact how an instance is scheduled and what flavors are, are available for that instance. Um, I didn't talk about flavors in Nova, but Nova also has a concept of flavors, which is how much of a virtual resource to consume. Flavors are how many virtual CPUs, how much ephemeral storage, um, which could be real ephemeral storage or it could be fake ephemeral storage that's not ephemeral, you get to keep it later, doesn't matter. Um, it also can, the flavors can now uh, have information about uh, NUMA characteristics. Is anybody not familiar with NUMA? Um, NUMA is, is sort of expressing, like, I need all of my CPUs to be on, all of my virtual CPUs to be on this physical CPU so that when they talk across the threads that they're not crossing C, uh, memory boundaries, and it's a performance thing. Um, so you can express in your flavor like that these need to be together, or they need to be separate, et cetera, et cetera. Neutron is the new network stack for Nova. Uh, originally, it was n just all in Nova. Then it got split out into something called Nova Network. And then it got turned into, well, a new thing got started called Quantum. And then somebody said, hey, you can't use that name. So it became Neutron. Um, and throughout all this time, Nova Network still lives, uh, just with not all the same function. Like, they have divergent functionality, which is totally awesome. Um, <laughs> But the intent is that Nova Network is going to go away and that Neutron is the way forward. Uh, Neutron does your IP allocations. So it, it has a database. And within that database, you say, use this CIDR block for this particular network. Um, it does interactions with your software-defined network. So Neutron isn't necessarily a software-defined network itself. What it does is interface with other software-defined networks. So Neutron has a pile of drivers. It can interact with uh, OVS, Open vSwitch. Uh, it can interact with um, Linux Bridge. It can interact with VLANs in, in physical switches that support VLAN allocations. Uh, it can interact with VXLAN, which is um, further away from the switch, more on the um, or it might actually be in the switch as well. I can't remember. Networking isn't my strong suit. Neutron does a lot of the networking stuff. Um, floating IPs, I hate this name because it's not really a floating IP, but a floating IP in Neutron parlance is that um, in a standard setup of OpenStack, you have an internal network that all of the instances get put onto, and that internal network is not routable. It's not routed. They can talk to each other, but they can't talk to anything else. They can talk out 
um, but nothing can talk to them. A floating IP is an IP address that will get allocated on what Neutron considers an external network, something that is routable. So it's a pile of routable IPs. And that creates essentially a NAT to your instance or to a port on your instance. Um, that's what they consider it as a floating IP because it can float between instances, not that it actually lives on the instance. Um, Neutron can take care of allocating that and attaching it to your port uh, so that if you want things to be able to directly connect to your instance, they can. Uh, and then once you have sort of a, an ingress into an instance, you might also want to be able to put up some rules about what can ingress to that instance. And by default, nothing can. So you have to create security groups. Um, and security groups are just a grouping of rules that get applied to uh, an instant, a port on an instance. And so rules are additive. Um, they can only allow access. So you start with nothing, and then you slowly add more and more access. Yes? Uh, maybe. It, it, it kind of depends on the drivers that you're using. The general idea is that anything that you feed Neutron as a floating IP pool is a set of IP addresses that are fully accessible, totally allowed in. Um, if there are firewall rules beyond what Neutron is creating, then you may not be able to open something that's blocked further down the line. Does that floating IP capability have any so in Nova Network, there was load balancing. In Neutron, there was and then there wasn't. Um, and there might be again, but there might not be again. So the wonderful thing about OpenStack is it's a community of, of a whole bunch of companies working together on this product. And the terrible thing about OpenStack is a whole bunch of companies working on this product. <laughs> and these companies want to make money. And one of the ways you can make money is by adding features to things that it doesn't already have. Um, Neutron's a big pile of drivers. And so there's a whole bunch of companies who are like, I'm going to make a proprietary driver that'll do the stuff that I want. And so they're interested in, in working on the driver capability and the driver interfaces without necessarily working on the capability itself within Neutron. Uh, and that's been a little bit of a contention. Um, but there is a project out there, I think it's still in incubation, which in OpenStack parlance means that it's kind of part of the, the system. We're allowing it to use some resources, but it's not getting the full resource set. So we're helping it along. And once it reaches a certain number of uh, criteria, then it can come out of incubation and become a full project. Um, the name of the load balancing project escapes me right now. But if you search for Neutron Load Balancer, you'll probably get the wrong thing. Um, if you search for OpenStack Load Balancer, you might get the wrong thing plus the right thing. Um, <laughs> but there is a project out there to provide load balancing capabilities. Um, yeah. What a lot of people end up doing right now in the short term is provision a very small instance that is hot proxy, or two instances that are hot proxy, and then um, or one, whatever, and then using hot proxy to load balance back into to instances inside. So then hot proxy gets the floating IP as far as uh, um, Neutron is concerned. That's what you do your DNS record to. But then it can throw it at however many instances you have behind it. Cinder. Uh, Cinder is you know like a Cinder block. It's block storage. Um, block storage is a thing that you can mount and write a file system onto and interact with it as if it were a local file system. So Cinder is not a file system itself. It is not a uh, network attached storage system. What it does is interact with other network attached storage systems to provide that capability into your instance. So the most basic thing that it can do is you can run Cinder volume because uh, it's one piece of the Cinder puzzle. Cinder volume can run on a machine that has an unallocated pile of disk capability that are in a logical volume group, uh, an LVM group. And when somebody says, I would like block storage, please, Cinder will allocate a section of that LVM, make a new uh, physical volume within that volume group, and then export that unadorned or unmodified over iSCSI. And then Nova, on the other side, will get that iSCSI target information, create that iSCSI link on the host, on the, the hypervisor host, and then expose the local 
disk that that iSCSI created into the guest, and then the guest inside of it can do whatever it wants with that block storage. Uh, it can also interact with existing storage area networks that you might have. Again, big pile of drivers, interact with a bunch of those that do all that sort of thing, but instead of um, instead of sender creating the iSCSI thing and linking, it might just talk to the SAN device and say, make a thing, please, and tell me the address that I can use to connect to it. And then it'll pass that back along to Nova, and Nova will get to it. Uh, provide snapshot capability um, to take a snapshot of the volume itself. Again, driver-based, and it does different things based on the driver. With LVM, it does an LVM snapshot, stores that somewhere, and then you can make new volumes based on the snapshot, backups, things like that. Um, it also is growing or has grown the capability of doing encryption. Uh, if you want to have your data in the volume encrypted while at rest, you want to be able to do, well, let me back up. You could do the encryption in the guest itself. So sender's just going to give you a volume. You get to do whatever you want with it. The guest could use um, Linux encryption Lux and encrypt that volume with a key uh, that either you write onto the file system, the ephemeral file system, or you manually type it in every time you do something with that volume. Um, and then everything will be stored encrypted. Uh, but if you don't want to do it in your guest, because volumes can be detached and reattached, if you want to do it sort of holistically, uh, there is a mechanism within the interaction between sender and Nova that allows uh, you to define a static key to use for encryption or to interact with a key server um, to get a key for encryption that uh, Nova will use when it does the attachment uh, it will decrypt it as it gets attached to the hypervisor host, and then it'll provide it to the guest unencrypted. So your guest instance doesn't have to know anything about the encryption that's happening. It just happen has to know that there's going to be storage at a certain place that I get to use. Um, and then sender knows that that volume is encrypted, has certain flags that throws on there. Sender doesn't ever really know the passphrase, doesn't need to know the passphrase, because Nova is the one that's taking care of it. Um, when it attaches, Nova does the encryption. Uh, and then, yeah, question back. Out of curiosity, does it actually also deal with like, uh, encrypted hard drives, if the hard drives are already encrypted? Like you, the, yeah, if it's happening be, at, a, at a point in which you can encrypt the hard drives that sender is using, um, sender is not going to be aware of it. Just it just wouldn't. It's just like you could raid the drives that sender is right. using and sender wouldn't know. It, that's happening at a lower level than what sender is interacting with. Um, just like with certain SANs, the SAN themselves offer like a SAN level encryption uh, where everything that touches that SAN is going to be encrypted. Sender's not going to know about that. It doesn't need to know about it. Nothing else needs to know about that. Um, they just need to know that it happens. And then Swift is your object storage. Uh, object storage is a lot like um, Dropbox. Even though Dropbox looks like it's a file system, it's not a file system. It's just a series of containers and objects. Um, the containers are like folders, and the objects are like files. They don't necessarily have to be files, but yeah. Um, you can directly access, or you can access the data by way of the sender API. So. Uh, that's generally how you supply credentials to authenticate that you should have access to those resources. But if you want to expose those resources out to the general public, um, you can make an API call which exposes that resource on a CD and a content delivery network um, or just a raw URL uh, that you can make use of. So it, generally where this gets used is um, static resources and a dynamic web content. Right, so uh, you don't want to store the images and et cetera on the host that's doing the dynamic generation of the, of the web data. You want that sitting in a, in a distributed content network and that your website just re refers to. So Swift is a way of storing those objects, exposing them through the CDN, versioning them, making sure they're distributed, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Swift, unlike some of the other things, is doing quite a lot of the work here. It's not interfacing with other things. It's actually doing the work. You provide Swift with unpartitioned hard drives, lots and lots of hard drives, and Swift will take care of making file systems on them. Uh, it does 
as much redundancy as you want. Um, when you go to read an object, Swift database knows what that object's hash sum should be, and it tries to read that from at least two or three different locations. Uh, if one location returns back a bad hash sum, Swift marks it as, hey, you're bad. Go refresh your stuff from other people, and it'll keep going until it gets the right hash sum. So there's, there's a ton of stuff that Swift actually does. It's one of the most complex pieces of OpenStack. Uh, but it's also kind of one of the neglected pieces. It doesn't get talked about a lot. Everything that he kind of <coughs> focuses on the really cool thing, which is making virtual computers. But storage was, was the, the real big win for um, what was going on in the cloud world. So with Swift, you can take a huge pile of mismatched hard drive sizes and computers and locations and et cetera, and make a really complex, cool, um, redundant, reliable content storage system that could be mirrored across data centers, mirrored across availability zones, replicated, et cetera, et cetera. Self-healing, it does that too. Um, it's really quite interesting. Scale out commodity hardware, exactly what I just said. All right. Uh, Keystone is a shared service across all of them. It's identity management. You create the tenants or the projects. It's schizophrenic on that term, but project is the new term. Um, creates the projects and the users within that all the services rely upon to validate. Uh, Role-based access control. You can tell which members or which users have particular roles, and then roles map to capabilities within the cloud. Uh, you can integrate Keystone with an existing directory service. So if you already have um, Active Directory or you already have a big uh, um, LDAP system, you can plug Keystone into those. And then Keystone is just acting as the gateway into that. Otherwise, it's storing everything in its own databases. Um, and then lately, a really cool thing is that you can federate your authentication between sites. Um, if you can federate between Keystone and something else, or you can federate between two Keystones as well, so that you create a relationship um, between an identity provider and a service provider. So in a, in a, in a burst world, um, a private cloud, a company that owns a private cloud has their own Keystone, and that's an identity provider. They create all the users and the roles and the groups and everything that um, is for within that company. And then they have a relationship with a public cloud. The public cloud is the service provider. The public cloud says, I know that I'm going to allow tokens to come in from this identity provider, and I'm going to map all the users into these particular groups. So the users and the credentials don't exist in the public cloud. They all exist in the private cloud. But the public cloud allows them to come in and act. Um, and so a uh, it, in a burst world, you're utilizing stuff locally. You say, I need something else externally. I'm going to make a call to public cloud, to a particular URL in that public cloud that's going to route me back to myself in order to generate a, a identity token locally that validates I am who I say I am according to my identity provider, and then provide that back to the public cloud. Public cloud is going to take that token and say, this matches all the cryptography information I have about that place. I'm going to take this thing, find the username or whatever identifier is configured, map it into the groups within the public cloud, and provide access to those, those resources. Did that cover your question? Or? I was going to say, is it, is it kind of like OAuth? It is, it is. OAuth is one of the providers. Um, you can you can do OAuth. You can also do sh Shibolith, I think is the pronunciation. Shibolith. Um, if you want to do Keystone to Keystone, you have to use Shibolith. Um, and that and in that way, Keystone runs behind Apache. Apache Shibolith does the thing and then passes it along to Keystone. Um, but yeah, you can do OAuth as well. OAuth works as a identity provider. Um, so you can, as a as a if I'm thinking about this right, as a service provider, you can accept things coming in from OAuth. Um, but if you want to be an identity provider, you can't push via OAuth. You have to push via Shibboleth. And then Horizon is the the dashboard, the web clicky, touchy, dewy thing, um, both for end users and cloud operators. Um, and that's the end of. That integration. Just real quick. Yes. Um, you familiar with the Magnum project? Containers. Containers. Yeah. So that's one of the. Dr 
containers. Somebody was going to bring up containers, of course. <laughs> So, uh, containers are like LXC containers or Docker. If you say Docker, people throw money at you, so Docker, Docker, Docker. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, uh, there's been efforts over the years of trying to expose containers through OpenStack. Um, and one of, those, one of the drivers for that is that there's only so small of a flavor you can make. You have to consume at least one virtual CPU. You have to consume at least a small subset a set of virtual memory and some amount of disk space. Um, that, and the action to create that really small instance has to take some amount of time. Uh, containers will allow you to take that thing and break it into much smaller pieces uh, while still, take, still having some level of isolation. So if you want to do really, really small microservices, which is all the rage right now, um, the, the smallest instance of a, a cloud or an AWS or whatever is not small enough and is not fast enough and you pay too much per service for those. So containerizing gets you um, just enough isolation, really, really fast to bring up, uh, and you still are only getting billed for the main thing that they're all running on. So at first, it was people launching big instances, putting container capabilities on those instances, and then interacting with that container capability with something completely different. And everybody's like, well, why can't we just do OpenStack things, use the same APIs, the same interface, all these other things that already exist? Why can't I do that just to make containers somewhere? Uh, and then there was a lot of work to provide that. So there's a, there was a Docker driver for Nova that's out and about um, that kind of worked doesn't expose all the dockery things that get you all the money, but still allows you to do containers. Um, and then there's another project called Magnum that is trying to expose more of the container capabilities, the, the Docker-like capabilities, through the OpenStack APIs. Uh, so I didn't bring it up because we don't use it much, but um, that is a thing to watch out for. Particularly now that AWS launched their container capability, now all the OpenStack people are like, ah, oh, we gotta catch up, gotta catch up, gotta have that. All right, so interacting or integrating, integrating all the services together. Uh, the services talk to each other through the RESTful APIs. So the APIs are a first-class citizen, right? It's not a bolt-on thing that has to be maintained separately from how the services interact with each other and how the command line interacts with it. Everything interacts over the APIs. So if you're using the API, you get to be a first-class citizen. Um, they also interact through RPC messages. Uh, APIs are generally used between projects. So when Nova is talking to Neutron and vice versa, that's happening over the public, or the, the we call it public APIs, but it's happening over the RESTful APIs. Um, within a service, so when uh, Nova API might be talking to Nova Scheduler, uh, it's going to be using RPC messages uh, that the service itself knows about, those aren't exposed out to end users because you wouldn't never really make a call directly into a subservice. You're calling to the API service and letting the API service do what you need. Um, those RPC messages are, nope. so those RPC messages are actually wrapped up generally in, uh, or they're not, they're not directly written to the subservice. There's no uh, RPC listener on the subservice. It's actually all done through a message bus. Um, and the message bus, bus is uh, the AMQP standard. And most everybody uses Rabbit um, because yay, Erlang. Um, but the, the RPC messages are wrapped up in bus messages. And then uh, all the services are listening and writing to various buses. And that's how they talk to each other. Uh, and then for state storage, state storage happens in databases. Almost every high-level service has a database that it uses or multiple databases that it uses. Um, and then, uh, so when you issue like a, actually I'll walk through it in a little bit, but um, the, the database is where a lot of the state gets stored so that you can shut down a service, bring up a service, and it's not keeping any state locally. All that state exists in the database. So it'll, when you bring up a service, it's going to look at its queue to see if there's any messages to read. It'll take a look at all the resources it's supposed to be managing and then hit the database to see what state the database says those services should be, uh, those resources should be in, and it'll make any adjustments it needs to. <coughs> So let's walk through uh, let's walk through booting an instance and see how some of the various services interact with each other. This is the technical part of the discussion. Uh, so a client gets an auth token from Keystone, so it's going to 
Uh, let's let's use the command line client as an example because it's easy to talk about. Uh, I type on the command line OpenStack uh, servers create flavor is two images Cirrus. Um, network is the externally named network or internally named network. Uh, my SSH key ID is etc. And I want to call it demo. And I say go. And the client first thing it does is tries to find what are my uh, credentials for talking to this cloud? And those could be stored in a environment variable uh, or in a, in a config file. Usually it's environment variables. Um, so it's going to take my project name, my username, my password, and then the auth URL that it knows that the cloud exists <clears throat> that, of the cloud that I want to talk to. Hits that auth URL, provides the data, and Keystone is sitting behind that auth URL, says, this project, this user, this password, that all looks good. Here's your token. Client then makes a call to, uh, along with a token, it's going to get what's called a catalog out of Keystone. Uh, the catalog is a reference to all the different services that are available in that particular cloud. So the client doesn't have any written down configuration of where the compute service runs. It only ever has information written down about where the identity service runs. So it gets a catalog, says, I want to do a compute thing. I'm going to look in the catalog, find the compute provider. Here's a URL for that provider. I'm going to go hit that URL. And when I hit that URL, I'm also going to provide some, some headers in the HTTP that says, here's my auth token. So it makes a call to Nova's REST API. Nova API takes that call in, uh, takes the token portion of it, and says, hey, Keystone, is this token still valid? Keystone, and it's talking, again, to the, the public API of Keystone. Um, Nova, the service, Nova API service, has its own credentials to talk with Keystone. There's an auth there. It gets complicated. But anyway, it sends the token over. Keystone says, yep, that token's all good. You're good to go. Um, so Nova API will immediately talk to the database and create a, a record in the database for the instance. And it's going to take all the stuff that you requested, put that in there, and it's also going to make some queries of the other services on its own to get some information about the stuff that you put in. Um, so like if you provided a image name rather than image ID, uh, Nova API is going to talk to the Glance service and say, what images have this name? Is there only one? Great, there's only one. I'm going to grab the UUID of that and use that in the record. Uh, same with the networks, going to figure out which network you wanted. Um, an IP address may get allocated at that time. It may not. Um, but essentially, it's going to make the record in the database. Then it's going to put a message on the bus for the scheduler service. It's going to say, please make this instance happen. Um, and here's the reference to the instance in the database, or the, the instance ID. Uh, at, at about this point, it also, this is when it generates the, the UUID for the instance when it's making that record. It's going to hand that back to the client with some, whatever information it's already gotten uh, about you know, image ID, network stuff. Um, and it's going to hand that back to the client and say, I have gotten your request. Here's a UUID of your instance. You can check back on it later. So it's the rest thing. It's not going to hold that connection open. It's going to take your request, send you back a result, and off you go. Then behind the scenes, it's put the message on the bus. The scheduler in its loop says, hey, look, there's a message for me. I'm going to grab it. Uh, it says, make an instance. Here's the, the UUID. I'm going to check the database to find that UUID, to find the information about that database, read all that in. And I'm going to um, also look at the database for uh, Instant or uh, compute capabilities, um, compute capability that that all the compute capability that's out there, and I'm going to run an algorithm on what's out there versus what's requested, and I'm going to make some semi-intelligent decisions about where to put this. And then it's once it's picked its compute that it wants to run this instance on, it's going to put a message on the bus for that compute service because compute service runs a, a message. Um, the compute uh, gets that message, and it needs to fetch that information out of the database. It talks to the database by way of the conductor, because we don't want all of our computes, because there could be thousands of them all talking to the database. It sends it to, by way of the conductor, says, please fetch this information about the instance that I'm supposed to build for me. Conductor gets that message, talks to the database, gets the information, sends it back to the compute by way of the message bus. Um, 
returns it to the compute. Uh, the compute makes a REST call to Glance in order to get the image, uh, and that's going to download it to the hypervisor. Um, Glance validates Compute's credentials because it's not going to let anybody talk to it. Um, another round trip through Keystone. Glance returns the image details. Uh, Glance is actually talking to an internal uh, subservice in order to do that. Um, Compute makes a REST call to Neutron to get networking config. Neutron validates, um, returns the networking details. Compute compiles all this data into a format for the hypervisor. So with libvirt, it's making a libvirt XML file for libvirt to deal with. For Zen server, it might be constructing a command line for VMware. I don't know what it's doing for VMware. For for ZOS, it's probably calling IBM and saying, somebody please make this instance on, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, it um, puts a message on the bus for a conductor to write information into the database about the instance um, as it's booting up the instance. So it executes uh, that thing, um, executes its hypervisor in order to make the instance happen. Um, and as it's, as it's coming up, it's checking on it and writing data into it. Uh, and all throughout this time, the client might be checking back in. So the client could be the command line. The command line has a minus minus pull switch on an instance build. So in that in case, the command line client will not return, but it'll sit in a quiet loop. And every couple of seconds, it'll check against the system and say, is my instance ready yet? Or has it errored or whatever? Um, the, if you're doing it through Horizon, there's a JavaScripty thing going on that says, that's checking on the status of that instance, because it knows that that particular instance is in build state. So it knows to check on those every couple of seconds. Um, but eventually, it uh, makes a call. Um, and everything is good, and you get back details about this instance. So the instance booted. Uh, it's got this particular IP address. We've generated this password for you if you didn't supply a SSH key. Um, any other sort of details you might need to know, that all gets returned. Now you've got a computer, and you can do whatever you want with that computer. Project structure. Uh, each project has its own Git repository um, that's mirrored to GitHub. It may look like they're all hosted on GitHub, but it's hosted on their own, but then mirrored off to GitHub. Changes are gated by Garrett. Garrett is a thing that fell out of Google for doing um, gating into a code repository. Nobody has write access to OpenStack project except for the Garrett bot. So anything that gets written has to go through the Garrett thing and then get written to the thing by Garrett. Um, there's core reviewers, and there's the hellacious automated CI that does a ton of stuff on every pull request. Uh, and then community elected project technical lead, who's the final decision on the projects, on the decisions for that project. But in, in reality, they're mostly just a um, moderator for the discussions that happen about the project, and, and will step in if necessary. Uh, Launchpad is used for issue tracking, um, although there's some work on creating an OpenStack project to manage the OpenStack projects uh, in, in, in a precursor to getting off of Launchpad. Oops. There are major releases every six months. We are weeks away from the next major release called the Kilo release. They coincide with a major summit of all OpenStack things. Um, this one's going to be in Vancouver in a couple of weeks. Should be about six or 7,000 people there to talk about OpenStack. It's kind of awesome. Um, as part of the release, there's a stable branch made for that release. And that stable branch gets critical updates done to it by the stable branch maintainer team for somewhere around 18 months of time. There is a barrier of entry. Um, it's somewhat light. In order to get your credentials, you have to sign a contributor licensing agreement that says that I am allowed to make contributions to this open source project. Um, and then you can throw a code at the wall and see what sticks. Uh, large conferences every six months. Uh, the in between conferences, there's a lot of mid cycle meetups for the various sub projects. So, Nova might have their own mid cycle meetup. Keystone will have their own. So, it's where a much smaller set of people who might want to actually get something done will get together at a location for a week and bang something out. Um, this is a look at a change request that went in. 
hey, that was mine. Cool. Um, the commit message at the top, Garrett throws in a change ID. There's some information about who submitted it and when. And then the, the CI system does a ton of testing of like, every, every single change that comes into an OpenStack project generally results in a cloud getting built somewhere with that change in it. And then a huge pile of regression tests ran against that cloud. Um, and then there's voting that happens. Uh, there's people that vote on it. Um, I think I, yeah, Andrew Lasky is a core reviewer. He voted on it, said yes. Um, Kane's another reviewer. Uh, Jenkins said it was good. Jenkins is powering a lot of this stuff. There are also third-party CI systems. So Citrix, ZenServer runs their own CI system. They plug in to Garrett, listen to changes, pull down those changes, build their own cloud, run their test on it, and report pass or fail back. Uh, let's see, the database CI does it. Um, Microsoft Hyper-V didn't actually get in on this one, but Microsoft runs their own. Uh, VMware runs their own. There's a whole bunch of things that, that go onto there. Um, there's a huge long, um, could do a whole hour session on how upstream CI manages to do the amount of work that they do. It's absolutely mind boggling how anything gets done in OpenStack, let alone the sheer velocity of things that get done. All right. How to get it? Um, public clouds, right? Rackspace public cloud. HP Helion Public Cloud, it does still exist despite the rumors that went around recently. Um, DreamHost has Dream Compute, it's Nova based. Uh, OpenStack.org has a marketplace website and they list a ton of different public clouds that are out there and the capabilities of those public clouds if you're looking for a certain capability or a certain geographical location. So all that stuff is there. Hosted private clouds. So this is private cloud as a service. Um, public clouds are everything is the service. You're on shared resources. Hosted private clouds are you still don't own the hardware. Somebody else is maintaining the hardware and the operating system and everything else on top of it. They're providing you the cloud capability, uh, but they're not having you share that capability with anybody else. So you get the whole machine. You get the network switches. You get the storage blocks. Everything is yours to use. Um, Blue Box Cloud, that's what we do. We do hosted private clouds. Uh, Morantis OpenStack Express, they're another company that does hosted private clouds. Rackspace Private Cloud, Rackspace will do a cloud for you on your hardware, but they'll also do it for you on Rackspace's hardware. And it's slightly different than their public cloud. Ubuntu does one as well. I'm not entirely certain why it's marketed as Ubuntu rather than Canonical, but it's all money going back into Spaceman. Um, <laughs> and then, again, the marketplace has a whole section of hosted private clouds. It's a growing marketplace. Yes? I have curiosity. Does somebody also deal with um, uh, basically uh, GPU acceleration, or would that be something different? That would be something different. Um, More of a physical thing. Yeah, that's probably something that would live in Nova, or if you wanted to do a driver for GPU type stuff. Um, I'm not entirely certain if that can get exposed all the way down into KVM or something like that, but interesting question. <coughs> I, know, I think, I think uh, Amazon's got something where you can actually get the GPU resources, I believe. Okay. Um, and then if you don't want to use somebody else's computer, if you have a big pile of computers sitting there that are being poorly managed, you can host your own private cloud. It's totally a thing that you can do. Um, it's what a lot of people do. Red Hat, it's, these are sort of distributions that you can get to run OpenStack on your stuff. Um, instead of Git cloning all of the various repositories and installing them and figuring out where all the config file goes, these are things that will help you with all of that. So Red Hat RDO, they have a uh, community RDO, which is kind of like the Fedora. It, it runs very frequently. Um, it's free to get, but they also have the paid for RDO, uh, which you get support, and it moves at a much slower lifestyle. Um, Marantis puts out a distribution that you can get uh, Rackspace private cloud software. Um, this is the part where you could run in their stuff on your hardware versus on their hardware. Cisco OpenStack private cloud used to be called MetaCloud. Cisco bought it, rebranded it, same sort of thing. Uh, what's that? I'm just kidding. I said now it's going to get worse. <laughs> <laughs> um, interestingly enough, this is the final place where we actually, or uh, another place where we have Swift rearing its head. Some of these other things, like RDO has a Swift capability. Um, 
Blue Box, our hosted private cloud has Swift capability. Uh, Swift Stack is a company solely around s large Swift things. So Swift is complicated enough and uh, interesting enough that there's a marketplace for people to just do Swift. And Swift Stack is a, is a great place for that. Um, our stuff that we use to make our hosted private clouds, we do all of the development for that out on public GitHub. And so you could take the thing that we do uh, and do it yourself on your own hardware. And it's all sitting in the, the Ursula repository uh, and a few others. And then the Rackspace people, the private cloud people, they have taken the things that they're using to make Rackspace private cloud and published it into StackForge, uh, which is on GitHub. Um, no, <coughs> mirrored to GitHub. Uh, that is doing their Ansible-based OpenStack deployment. Ours is Ansible-based as well. Theirs is Ansible. Um, the interesting thing about theirs is they containerize a lot of their services. So Nova is sitting inside of a container. Glines is sitting inside of a container. Um, and they're doing stuff that way. So that's all published out there. They've, uh, they originally, there's a whole bunch of rack space isms in the code tree, and they've cleaned all that out. Uh, so that's another really cool place to get stuff. <clears throat> Again, there's a marketplace for all the distributions um, of OpenStack. And then if you need help, if you want to do it on your own stuff, but you need help in doing it, there's a marketplace for consulting. Uh, there's a ton of consulting. I'm not going to list them here, but you can find it on the marketplace there. All right. Learning more about OpenStack, because everybody wants to. There are docs.openstack.org. The docs for OpenStack are some of the best I've come across for a very large open, stack, uh, open source project. Um, the docs project uh, within OpenStack deserves way more credit than they get for what they make happen. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, there are numerous varied multiple pound OpenStack dash whatever channels on Freenode IRC. Uh, meetings happen on Freenode. Individual projects have their space on Freenode. Um, higher level groupings of projects. They're like OpenStack QA covers a bunch of different QA projects within OpenStack. Uh, all those things are on Freenode. Um, generally, they're all pretty friendly and welcoming to people. And there's a variety of OpenStack mailing lists. If mail is more your thing, uh, there are meetups. There's a meetup in Seattle, uh, the OpenStack Seattle meetup. There's stickers in the front with our logo on that. Um, those happen every month. Uh, they bounce around locations, but a lot of times they're at Blue Box, um, right by Pike Place Market. Uh, generally, we get in a excuse me a, a, a speaker that'll come in and talk about a particular thing, and then it's socializing and um, lightning talking and questioning and answering things like that. Opus XL. And then getting hired. Uh, if you know OpenStack, there's a ton of places that would like to hire you. It's kind of a cool thing. Um, we're one of those places. We're hiring for an OpenStack engineer. That it's going to work on my team to do all the cool things that we do with a uh, host of private clouds. Um, you could find more on our website or come talk to me. If you talk to me, I get a referral bonus. It's totally awesome, so you should come talk to me. Um, if you don't want to work for Blue Box, uh, there's a whole bunch of other jobs. Uh, OpenStack.org slash community slash jobs is a public job board that all the places that are hiring can put up stuff. Um, there's generally jobs from entry level to I can design clouds in my sleep and they will never fail. Like <laughs> They will literally throw truckfuls of money at you for that. Um, if you're interested in that, go there. It's awesome. And that's it for my content, except for one more thing. Uh, there's another show that I'm going to plug for that's happening in October. It's the Seattle GNU Linux Festival. It'll be our third year doing it. Uh, you should come. It's going to be awesome. So questions? Yes? What do you recommend to monitor a uh, OpenStack cluster? That's a really great question. Uh, there depends on what you mean by monitor, but if you want to keep track of the health of the services and the health of the hardware underneath, then typically there's, there's two things that I see a lot of used. Nagios is used and Sensu is used. And both of those communities have various pieces that are out there for interacting with OpenStack to, man to monitor particular services. Um, or if there isn't, uh, I know that we, Bluebox, publish our Ursula-monitoring repository where we 
have written a number of Sensu plugins to talk to OpenStack services to measure and monitor. Um, if you are talking more about uh, monitoring or instrumentation of OpenStack, where the calls are going, what the services are saying, what's going on, that there are a couple of different projects within OpenStack to do that type of thing. Uh, one of them is StackTac, the other one is Salometer. I haven't, but I think there are a few. So there's a, um, one of the mailing lists and one of the IRC channels is the OpenStack operators. It's a community of the people like me who are actually running OpenStack clouds. And you can ask those types of questions there and you'll get lots of answers. And the operators have their own mid-cycle meetup as well. And we have kind of our own track at the Vancouver Summit <laughs> and where you can get into a room with people who are actually doing the stuff rather than writing the code and throwing it over the wall. Any other questions? Yeah. For the instances, is there a way to do dynamic DNS? Uh, dynamic DNS, as in? So you can resolve, instead of connecting to the IP address, the floating oh, IP. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, not necessarily the floating IP. There is a DNS as a service service that is called Designate. Um, it's not fully baked yet, but it's on its way. And that provides you an API for creating DNS records and whatever DNS backend you happen to have. So as you build up an application that might make an instance show up, you could also get the IP address out of that instance, make a designate call, or not, I'm sorry, um, attach a floating IP to that instance, make a designate call to make a DNS record for that floating IP. Um, with uh, probably not Kilo, uh, probably Liberty. Um, Liberty is the one after Kilo. So, is there, what do people use generically now for DNS? Uh, Rackspace has their own um, that you can plug in, and if uh, there's, I think theirs is backed by Power DNS, um, and then there, uh, I think HP has one as well. I'm not sure what theirs is. Uh, Inside of a cloud, Neutron kind of provides some of that. It has a whole range of uh, DNS records that are based on an IP address name, so they're just pre-baked, ready to go. Uh, they're, they're not really based on the name you give your instance, um, so that doesn't quite help you. Um, what a lot of people do is they use automation software to make their infrastructure show up. So like I use Ansible to talk to Nova to make instances show up. And when I do that, Nova gives me back a bunch of information to Ansible about what IP address might have been assigned. Um, so on some clouds, you get a directly routable IP address. So with Rackspace, you get a directly routable IP address. You can take that information out of your instance, make another call to whatever DNS system you have to make that record show up. Um, uh, or when you make the floating IP and attach the floating IP, you would get back information about what that IP address is. And again, you can do that in whatever you need to do. All right. I thought I saw some other hands. Any other hands? Questions? Then everybody enjoy your lunch. Thank you.